In the Warhammer 40k universe, there's probably no greater antagonist than that of the Chaos Gods. But what if I was to tell you that everything we think we know about them is wrong? That they're not the dark and evil entities that we've been told to believe they are? Now what if I told you that in the grand scheme of the 40k universe, the Chaos Gods are actually the good guys? What if I was to tell you that it was actually the folly of sentient species that twisted them into a dark reflection of what they once were? And I know this sounds a little crazy, but what if I was to tell you that every single dark and terrible thing you've ever read about the Chaos Gods was no more than Imperium propaganda? Now let's talk about how the Chaos Gods are actually the protagonists of Warhammer 40k. Now obviously I'm being a little bit hyperbolic here, and depending on when you're watching this, I'm a day or two late for April Fools. But the reality isn't 100% far off from this. Now it's true that the Chaos Gods are normally depicted as the number one evil force in the universe, but in truth, it's a lot more complicated than that. The gods are infinitely complex. It's easy to think of them as just some crazy powerful entities and some other far off universe for us to fight. But that's just how they're depicted in the stories. Stories that, more often than not, were written from the Imperium's point of view. The deep lore shows that they're a manifestation of all emotions, not just the negative ones. So how did they get here? Why are they only shown to basically be evil incarnate? To be honest, the simplest answer to this is this is Warhammer, with an emphasis on the war part. The universe has a certain identity that's come to be expected, and the things that don't fit that mold will often be pushed to the background, even though they still exist. When it comes to the true nature of the gods, we really honestly can't even begin to comprehend their vast nature. Hundreds upon thousands of books could be written about their goals, their motivations, and desires, and we would barely even begin to scratch the surface of what they truly are. And although they have a dark side, which we are all intimately familiar with, the gods also have a lot of elements to them that we would see as inherently good. For example, did you know that Korn, the god of blood and skulls, actually teaches his followers to have mercy for the weak? Did you know that Nurgle teaches us to accept that which we cannot change and not to fear death? Or what about the often overlooked fact that Zinch inspires people to read books and seek knowledge to better themselves? Or how about how Slanesh, at the end of the day, just wants you to be happy doing what you love. Now, if trillions of people worship and serve them, they can't be all bad, right? Why would so many societies turn to the worship of something that is unquestionably evil? Now, don't get it twisted. There are many individuals out there who would enter packs with things that are without a doubt evil simply for the sake of power. There are definitely cults that exist that want to see the universe burn and have nothing but ill content for the unforgiving galaxy they were grown up in. But what about everyone else that worships them? What about the psychers that are persecuted by the Imperium and taken from their families to be sacrificed to the Golden Throne? Does Zinch not offer them an escape? Does he not tell them there is nothing wrong with them and that their powers are not to be feared, but celebrated? What about those individuals that end up worshiping Nurgle, not for his disease and spreading death, but in the desire to no longer feel pain and to spread new life through the universe? What of the artists, the poets, the musicians who end up aligned with Slanesh? The people who seek to experience joy above all else, who have grown up in a world that sees them as nothing more than a cog in the Imperial War Machine, that their art is nothing but a waste of time and resources that could have been better spent creating weapons. What of the warrior cults throughout the galaxy that view honorable combat as a way of life? They're not blood-crazed berserkers or mindless killing machines. They're individuals whose lives revolve around combat, but they have an unbelievably strong sense of honor and tradition. They have an ethical code that can never be broken. The major takeaway here is that the gods do have a good side, but it's an element that is not often focused on. In fact, for the simplicity of the story, the gods are traditionally portrayed as evil incarnate, just in four different flavors. Nurgle is about rot and disease and spreading death across the universe, Slanesh is about excess in all forms and pushing their followers to ever-increasing acts of depravity. Zinch is about treachery and deception, while well, Korn is probably the most straightforward of them all, the desire to take skulls and spill blood. But this doesn't make any sense, as the worship of the gods has spread to every corner of the galaxy, whether that be through secretive cults hiding in plain sight on Imperial hive worlds, or various tribal aliens that exist on undiscovered planets, completely removed from the greater conflict. And worship of these gods is not a new thing. For as far as we can tell, it has existed in one form or another forever, across millions of different cultures, spread across time and space. Now we can see a pretty interesting example of this in Lorgar's Primarch novel. We see that the individuals of his world follow what they call the Old Faith, 
which worshipped individuals that bear a pretty striking resemblance to the Chaos Gods, although they went by different names, and those good aspects of them were what was praised. They were not seen as evil in any way, shape, or form. In fact, here is a prayer that they would offer in the name of the Primordial Four. O oh, great powers, dwellers in the Imperium, here today are thanks for thy creation and thy merciful aversion of thy divine wrath at our trespasses. King of storms, Lord of blood, here today are thanks for thy strength and thy protection from the conquest of the impure. Queen of mysteries, Lady of fate, here today are thanks for thy knowledge and thy watchfulness against the hazards of uncertainty. Prince of hearts, sire of dreams, here today are thanks for thy inspiration and thy indulgences of our mortal ambitions. Princess of life, mother of hope, here today are thanks for thy vigor and thy generosity in times of need and assertory. Praise be to the prophets, praise Khan, praise Tezin, praise Slanat, and praise Narag. Now this is just one example of the infinite variations of their worship across the universe. But much like religions in the real world, Many of them depict similar events and entities, just written in different ways. The Chaos Gods are no different. They have been worshipped across time and space by millions of different cultures, and each of those cultures praise them for a specific element. In reality, the gods are just not as black and white as we think they are. They do not represent a single element. Korn, for example, is the god of bloodshed and murder, but he's also the god of honor and tradition. One of the things he preaches that doesn't really get focused on is his code of mercy for the weak. There is no honor in fighting somebody that can't defend themselves. Although Korn, quote, cares not where the blood flows from, only that it flows. Now that's sort of a misconception. We do not see a direct manifestation of Korn in the stories. We only see his followers and his demons that act as a proxy for his will. And like with all religions, most people do not follow their teachings to the letter. People tend to get fixated on a singular element and then base their lives around that. There's a vast difference in the knowledge levels of a trained religious scholar who has spent decades studying religion versus the casual follower who has probably skimmed the first few chapters of their holy book. Religions of today have been used in the past to justify some pretty horrific stuff, even if that went counter to the entire message of their sacred text. Certain lines and paragraphs were butchered and contorted to fit the goals and ambitions of whoever was in charge at the time. And from my perspective, for somebody to say they understand and know the will of a creature that is a billion times more complex and advanced than them is in itself blasphemous. These are entities that measure their IQ in the tens of billions. They are everywhere and nowhere and have always existed and never existed at the same time. They are as much concepts as they are physical creatures. To lay your eyes on the true form of such a thing would probably cause your head to explode as the human mind was not meant to process something so magnificent. Corn, for example, is infinitely complex, even if we don't give him credit for that. But the human mind is not, so his followers are often portrayed as nothing more than blood-drunk barbarians focused on a single element of his teachings. And speaking of those teachings, stories are written down and then rewritten hundreds of times over. They are translated and retranslated over and over again until their original meaning has been twisted and contorted, specifically to represent not the will of the god, but the will of the man in charge of interpreting the meaning of ancient holy words. Over time, this religious institution can be twisted a million different ways from Sunday, the original meanings completely lost to time. And since the Chaos Gods are a direct manifestation of our own emotions and belief, this plays into their current nefarious state. They have been morphed into the essence of evil, rather than that of their original neutral design. Now here in the real world, we can see the effects of this on major religions of our time. And I'm not making a judgment here, but I think it's safe to say that a holy book being written centuries after the events it depicts, and then being rewritten over and over again, can contort its meaning. Now imagine that on a scale that spans all of space and time, their teachings being interpreted or put to paper by hundreds of thousands of different species. And then those writings are rewritten and retranslated over and over again into infinity. Needless to say, the pamphlets that they hand out at the chaos meetings probably don't accurately depict the will of the gods. So before we dive into each one of them, we should understand a couple of key fundamentals. The first is that the gods are not good or evil. This is a concept that doesn't really exist with them. They are what they are. They are the primordial forces of the universe. They are the collective emotions, thoughts, and desires of every sentient creature that has ever or will ever exist. Each god is made up of millions of different traits and ideals. To put it in terms of good or evil is only an attempt by us mortals to try to categorize and understand the impossible. 
Now, the second thing is that even though we have an exact date when one of the gods, Slaanesh, was born, as their birth was heralded by massive warp storms that ravaged the galaxy for thousands of years, and the inevitable climax of their creation tore a hole in our universe and left a festering wound in reality that we know today as the Eye of Terror, a place where the physical and immaterial universes overlap. However, from the gods' perspective, Slaanesh has always existed. The gods have always been and never were simultaneously. The warp is weird, to say the least. And speaking of the warp, the third thing you have to understand is that from our mortal perspective, it wasn't always the realm of chaos. It wasn't always this twisted and dark realm that houses infinite demons and a malice for the physical universe. In its simplest terms, the immaterium is a shadow. It is a reflection of the physical universe. It is a realm made up of not atoms and molecules, as it has no physical substance, but a universe of the intangible, a realm of emotion and thought, of ideas and concepts. It is a mirror of our own universe. It is directly influenced by the thoughts and emotions of those in the realm of the physical. To understand this, we have to examine the universe long before humanity crawled out of the primordial ooze. Now, there was a period in time more than 60 million years ago where the universe was rather peaceful. We can be sure there were wars happening, but they were localized to specific planets. But on a whole, the Milky Way was a pretty chill place to live. Now that all changed with the war in heaven, the great battle that spanned the entire galaxy. A war like nothing the universe had ever seen before and has yet to see again. Now this was a war between the Necrons and the Old Ones, and before their great battle had ever even really started heating up, the Necrons were on a galaxy-spanning conquest to purge everything in sight. Day after day, week after week, quintillions of souls flooded into the Immaterium. Wrathful and hateful souls that had their perfect way of life obliterated by an ancient alien force. The peaceful universe that existed before was twisted and corrupted with hatred. Like if you add a drop of poison to a cup of water, that single element would spread out and corrupt the entire thing. The venomous emotions of hatred, despair, wrath, and every other negative emotion you can think of poisoned the sea of souls, and thus began the corruption of the physical universe. Now these emotions surely existed before, but they were not the dominating emotional force that governs the universe in the 41st millennium. After the war, hatred came to dominate the universe, and the warp became a reflection of this. Now not much is known about the gods at this time, but before the war in heaven, by all accounts, the warp had been full of peaceful entities. Now those entities were twisted beyond recognition, they became hateful and venomous monstrosities that preyed on the souls of the newly departed. Now, although this new influx of negative emotion twisted the warp into the realm of chaos we know today, those good emotions still exist in our modern physical universe, and thus they play a part in its reflection. The realm of chaos is not hatred made manifest, but a collective of all emotions, and the gods are no different. However, the universe and thus its reflection have become wildly out of balance. So let's take a moment to examine each one of these gods, and to not turn this completely into a chaos propaganda video, we will examine both sides of them. Now let's start with probably the most well-known of the chaos gods, Korn. Now, Korn is the god of wrath, the god of blood and skulls, and basically the literal concept of violence. But Korn is more than this. He is also the god of honor and tradition. He sees no victory in taking skulls in his name from the weak. There is no honor in preying on the elderly or children. So, in a sense, their skulls are worthless to him. Now, Korn teaches that to become more powerful is the ultimate goal, but power is gained through hard work and tradition. This is the path of a dedicated warrior, one who trains every single day with a sword and never takes time off, one that hones their path and becomes the ultimate conqueror. Korn teaches to crush your enemies and to seek as much power as possible, but also to honor your opponents. The goal is not to be a bloodthirsty tyrant, the goal is not to be a serial killer. Korn teaches that to engage in battle is the most primal and honorable path a warrior can take. There is nothing more human than meeting your equal in battle and overcoming impossible odds. To do this, you must look your opponent in the eye and then overpower them through your own force of will and strength. That most importantly, you earn through hard work and discipline. To use magic or ranged weapons or anything that would give you an unfair advantage is unthinkable to Korn. These are the coward's tools. There is nothing honorable about hiding in the shadows and striking your opponent's back. This is a weakling's way of fighting. Now, various warrior cults across space and time have worshipped Korn. In our own world, this can take the form of knight households or samurai castes or all manner of honorable and powerful nations across history. All have praised and worshipped him, 
even if he went by a different name at the time. However, these aspects of Korn have all but been forgotten. He's depicted as an entity that demands only blood. The honorable aspects of him have taken a back seat, and his followers certainly do not follow his teachings to the letter. Now, we see hordes of corn berserkers ripping and tearing their way across the cosmos, destroying everything in their path, blood drunk with power, looking to take skulls no matter who or what they come from. Now, this is definitely part of corn, but it is not the whole, and that's really important to remember, as it is a reflection of his teachings being bastardized over the millennia. It's more representative of the hateful state of the galaxy, and less so corn himself. Now, enough about Korn. What about his brother Nurgle? Does the Lord of Pestilence have a good side? So, the most important thing when it comes to understanding Nurgle is that he doesn't just represent death and disease. He's also the god of life. Life, death, and the cycle of those two things. When one life ends, new life begins. When something dies, its body produces bacteria. Trillions of tiny creatures spring from existence. The dead body nourishes the land and other animals, and when they die, the process repeats anew. This is a cycle that can never be broken. It ebbs and flows, speeds up and slows down, but it never ends. It is one of the fundamental realities of the universe. All life must come to an end. But this is not something to be feared, as the process of life and death is beautiful. And there is peace in knowing that it can't change. Change is anathema to Nurgle. All that lives must die, and all death produces new life. Now, even if we accept life as a cycle, what does Nurgle offer a normal, sane person? Well, the first thing is that the followers of Nurgle are made practically immortal. They become incredibly resilient to pain and disease. When you're lying on your deathbed, afflicted with something that cannot be cured, there comes a moment where you will feel completely alone. The doctors have all given up on you, and you only have a few days left to live. Your family and friends are supportive, but how could they know what you're going through? It is at this time, your final moments, when he whispers in your ear. He tells you not to be afraid and that this is all part of life, but he is also sympathetic to your position and he understands that you are in pain. It is in this moment, when you are at your most vulnerable, that Nurgle offers you a deal. Now, Nurgle can't change what's already happened. He can't take away your sickness, but he can take away the pain and he can allow you to continue living. The cycle of life never changes, but he can basically hit the pause button for you to stagnate at the moment in time right before your death, and in a sense, be reborn in his image. Those that accept this offer have their lifespans extended indefinitely. Their bodies still rot and their sickness gets worse and worse, but they don't feel pain anymore. And they will spread his message through the galaxy, teaching all they come across to embrace despair, to accept disease as a gift from the grandfather, and do their part to spread his love across the cosmos. Now, Nurgle and his followers are pretty horrific to look at, they represent decay and rot. The primordial fear of death that we all share has completely encompassed basically everything about them. They are individuals who have given themselves over to despair. They no longer feel much of anything. Pain, emotion, desire, all has been stripped away from them. And although from our perspective, this is something of a horrible fate, to fully embrace despair is seen as a blessing. But despair is not just to be miserable. This acceptance of it is basically to accept what cannot change, that there is no point in struggling against the cycle of life. Nurgle teaches his followers to find inner peace in this acceptance. To give up and stop caring about everything is the biggest relief one can imagine. In the novel The Lords of Silence, we see a guardsman who has been captured by the Death Guard. In one of their twisted experiments, they literally remove his heart. But he's been touched by Nurgle and thus cannot die. His heart remains beating in the Death Guard Lord's possession, and if he was to leave the ship, he would surely die. So the Death Guard do not put him under any lock and key. They let him freely roam around their ship and go wherever he wants to. Over time, the touch of Nurgle gets stronger and stronger, and he begins to lose himself to his corruption. After a few weeks, he looks at himself in the mirror and is shocked by what he sees. His hair is falling out, his skin is oily and pockmarked, his teeth have begun to rot. And on one hand, he's horrified by what he is becoming. But on the other, there's this massive sense of relief. You see, in the guard, he led an incredibly rigorous and restricted life. Every moment of every day was part of a routine. And it suddenly dawns on him that since he's been aboard the ship, he hasn't even polished his boots or brushed his teeth once, something he would have been reprimanded for or possibly beaten in his old life. And it's like a massive weight has been lifted off of his shoulders. The voice in his head that is telling him how horrifying this is slowly gets smaller and smaller over time, and the idea that there is no hope for him to ever escape slowly begins to be accepted. 
Now, this example is gonna sound super weird, but just bear with me. How often do we in the real world wish that we could just give up? Maybe it's something we don't ever acknowledge out loud or even directly think about. The concept is pushed all the way to the back of our minds by the rigorous structures of society. But wouldn't it be nice to just stop trying? To just not care anymore about anything? We force ourselves to go to the gym, we brush our teeth, we do our hair, we shower, we force ourselves into awkward social situations because it's expected of us. We live by the laws of society, and thus every action we take is structured to living up to its ideals. Even if we don't realize it or acknowledge it, every moment of our lives is spent doing what we're told to. It's what is expected and demanded of us. But what if we didn't have to? What if we didn't have to do anything? To realize that nothing matters and we're all just part of a never-ending cycle of life, death, and rebirth. To give in to despair and accept that nothing can change. The embrace of despair is a horrifying concept to us, as well it should be. But to someone who has been blessed by Nurgle, this realization is an incredibly profound moment. Now, without question, we can obviously see the darker elements in play here. But on its surface, Nurgle teaches you to accept what you can't change, that life and death are part of a glorious cycle, that death is not something to be feared, but celebrated, and to make peace with that and know true freedom. To borrow from Disney, we all must take our place in the great circle of life. And you know, now that I think about it, I've always been against Disney buying Warhammer 40K, but if they did, Nurgle would make a pretty good Disney princess, so let me know in the comments what you think about that. Okay, so now moving on from Nurgle, we have to talk about his brother Zinch, and his followers have a pretty different view on things. So Zinch is basically the polar opposite of Nurgle. Whereas Nurgle is all about stagnation and a cycle with no variation, Zinch is all about change. He teaches that there is no great cycle, that nothing has to stagnate, that fate and destiny are what we make of them. The future is malleable and unknown, and that's what makes life worth living. He is depicted as the god of treachery and magic, of deceit and forbidden knowledge. His followers are shown to be relentlessly deceptive, often attracting politicians and others who would seek power through duplicitous means. Those who seek his favor are quite commonly scholars, philosophers, and would-be practitioners of the arcane arts. Those who see knowledge as the most treasured and valuable asset in the history of the universe. But Zinch isn't just some mad, spell-slinging trickster god. Change by its very nature can take infinite forms. Zinch teaches his followers that they are in charge of their own destiny. If there's anything about their lives that they don't like, they have the power to change it. Their fates are in their own hands. Anyone who has power over you now may be working underneath you tomorrow. The gambler who's down on his luck may strike it big on the next round of cards. He preaches that you can lift yourself out of poverty with your own force of will through knowledge and the desire to make a change. You have control of your own future. Now, although knowledge is seen as dangerous by the Imperium of Man, Knowledge is a fundamental force when it comes to bettering yourself and changing your own destiny. Now, Zinch is the god of all knowledge. His libraries are full of every secret and every story that has ever taken place across a million universes. And admittedly, he isn't all-knowing when it comes to the future. There are infinite potential futures stretched across infinite universes. But the unknown is not something to be feared. It is something to be embraced. Change is a powerful force. Every single moment across the galaxy, change happens an infinite amount of times. There are infinite decisions being made in every moment, each causing a change and countless different paths the future may take based on the outcome of those decisions. However, in the storyline of 40K, this is often portrayed as a negative thing, especially when being juxtaposed to the relentless control and persecution of the Imperium. The fate of those who work for the Imperium have all but physical chains binding them to their destinies. There may be room for advancement for those that prove their worth, but in the Imperium of Man, only in death does duty end. It's very rare that you find an individual such as the rogue traders who were able to carve out their own destiny. For the vast majority of humanity, they're shackled to the will of the God Emperor, toiling away in his factories, working on his engines of war, until the day they can no longer do so. Now, Zinch represents an opportunity to shatter those chains, to spit in the face of the Imperium and embrace whatever destiny you want. But a word of caution to those would-be truth seekers. Those who delve too deep into forbidden lore may not like what they find. Fate and destiny are fickle and flexible things, and those who worship the Lord of Change may find themselves wishing for the security of those bindings once more. So we have one god left to go, and let's talk about the god of excess. Now, Slanesh is the youngest chaos god, and we know pretty much the exact date they came to be. 
However, as I mentioned before, from the gods' perspective, they have always been. Slaanesh is the god of excess, hedonism, and depravity, and much like the change brought on by his brother, excess can take on infinite different forms. Slaanesh teaches their followers that whatever activity brings you pleasure, you should pursue it indefinitely. Now, pleasure is not something the Imperium puts in high regards. The pleasure of man interferes with their work, and that if you're gonna find joy in anything, it should be in the service you provide to the Emperor. That pleasure should only come from duty and nowhere else. Now, Slaanesh teaches us that this is a hot load of garbage, that there's nothing wrong with feeling good. And although often depicted as a sex god, joy can come from anything, not just pleasures of the flesh. Are you a painter or a musician or an artist of any form? If creating beautiful things makes you happy, then that's what you should always be striving for. Now, this notion in itself is not evil. In fact, most would agree that doing what makes you happy is a pretty admirable goal. Now, countless groups, societies, and religions across time and space have also preached the pursuit of happiness as the most important path a person can take. The desire to create a world where everyone is free to do whatever makes them happy, where there are no taboos and joy is the ultimate goal. Slaanesh is the god of love, passion, and desire, and without Slaanesh, the galaxy would somehow be a million times more bleak and miserable than it is in 40k. So all of this sounds pretty good, right? Well, this is not how they are depicted in the lore. The audience has shown multiple examples of excess taken to such extremes that it becomes the polar opposite of joy. It becomes a depraved horror story. You see, an individual who gives themselves over completely to the pursuit of joy will quickly get bored of the things that originally made them happy, no matter how much they liked it in the beginning. Inevitably, they will have to kick it up a notch, so to speak, to experience the same level of pleasure once again. This is a very slippery slope that leads to addiction and depravity. The painter that originally enjoyed painting beautiful landscapes, under the influence of Slaanesh, may turn to using their own blood on their canvas. And once that stops being artistically fulfilling, they may take to the streets in search of victims to use in their twisted art galleries. Now this may sound like a pretty extreme example, but it's exactly what happened to Serena De Angelis, one of the remembrancers aboard Fulgrim's flagship who visited the very same temple dedicated to the worship of Slaanesh that the Emperor's children discovered. And like them, she would eventually descend into excess and madness. All of this is covered in the novel Fulgrim, but we'll cover that in a future video. So if there's anything I want you to take away from this video, it's that the Chaos Gods are infinitely complex, with more facets and ideals than people give them credit for. And in the universe of 40k, they make for some pretty compelling antagonists. But what if the warp had never been truly corrupted? What if it had never become the realm of chaos? What if hatred and vengeance and the desire for bloodshed and war had never been allowed to infect the Sea of Souls? If the gods were not locked in their great game to dominate the universe, could things have been different? If the galaxy was at peace, would the chaos gods' negative aspects be what have come to dominate their personalities and thus the desires of their followers? What if there were no dark gods? What if all we had was the god of honor, of life, of knowledge, and of love? Are we as a collective sentient species responsible for the current state of the Immaterium? Is the current state of that universe, and by extension its gods, a result of the folly of man and our infinite flaws? And let me know what you think down in the comments because I'm genuinely curious what you think. And I'll leave you with this final thought. The followers of Chaos are often referred to as the slaves to darkness. They are completely withholden to the whims of their dark masters. But if the Chaos Gods are a reflection of us, their power being directly tied to the emotions and wills of man, so much so that in the war-torn future of the 41st millennium, their noble and honorable sides have all been but pushed into complete obscurity. In this sense, are the Gods not actually slaves to us? Thanks again to my patrons for supporting the work that I do. And if you enjoyed this production and want to help make more content, then consider joining my Patreon today. Additionally, this video was originally going to be like a short, but I'm still doing those, but I'm also kind of phasing them out because these longer videos are what I really enjoy doing. Um, so this was going to be a short video, but there was just so much information I wanted to cover that I was like, ah, screw it. I'll just make it into a long one. So again, thanks for hanging out all the way to the end and happy wargaming.